Hey, Joe. Hey, buddy. How are you? Good. How you doing? Great, man. Hey, thanks for taking the time, man. It's, it's good to meet you. Hey, thank you for taking uh, asking me. Yeah, of course. I know uh, I played with your brother over the years a couple of times. Wow, great. Yeah, oh, I know him a bit. Cool. So um, I guess let's I wanted to maybe just talk to you first about about your newest album, which which is you did great work on it, man. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Fantastic. And then maybe get into some biographical stuff as well. OK, so if we can just uh, talk to me about the album and what and what direction are you headed? Yes. Well, um, I just finished my album with Smoke. Uh, I, I, uh, my first one with uh, Witten Marcellus, Time to Swing during COVID. And um, that went really well. I've been waiting uh, 20 years to uh, record with Witten ever since we did the very first one. Um, the House of Tribes. That was like, 19, I forget what year it was. But after that moment in the House of Tries, I knew I wanted to uh, one day record with him. And so I, was, I, I saved it for like 20 years. Like I had a little chip in my pocket and I played it and he was kind enough to do it. And so then I was able to make another one. And that was with uh, Kenny Barron Trio. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do, if I was going to do a next one or what was going to happen. But I got a call out of the blue to play with Kurt Rosenwinkel at the Village Vanguard. And uh, surprisingly enough, I'd, I'd never met Kurt before and I'd never really heard his playing. Hmm. As strange as that is, uh, we were just, I guess, running in different circles. And when I went to play the Vanguard that week, I was uh, blown away by how great he was on guitar. His music, his virtuosity, the way he just played, it, it seemed like he was free. And uh, I'd, never heard the mu I'd never heard music like that before. I was really, I was blown away. And so when I, when I heard him, I knew immediately that I wanted to document that for uh, myself and make a record. And it was really based upon my experience of playing with Kurt Rosenwinkel. So all I really had to do was uh, find people that would complement that uh, idea. And so that's really where it came from. All right, and so the, the, uh, the musicians you chose, I mean, they seem very well suited for each other and it's very well connected and there's a vibe throughout the whole record. Mm. Had you worked with them prior to this record? Well, I knew the piano player, Julius Rodriguez, as a, like basically a, kind of a kid. He was going to Caramore studying with uh, Curtis Fuller in the summer. I remember meeting him up at maybe Saratoga Jazz Festival. And so I saw him kind of grow up and we played together a bunch a little before COVID and then during COVID. He's one of those guys that plays great piano. He's also a great drummer, great guitar player. He just wants to do everything. And that was like, uh, it's kind of the new uh, thing with the, the youngsters, man. Uh, they just want to do it all. And I, I appreciate that, man. And uh, so I knew him. I played a little bit with Emmanuel Wilkins. He's another, um, well, he's a star now, but he was, you knew even five years ago when he was like 20, 19, that he was a great player, had a great voice. So I played with him a little bit. And of course, Bob Hurst, he's been a star. Robert Hurst has been a star since, you know, Black, uh, you know, Whitten Marsalis and all those uh, groups with Branford and Kenny Kirkland and Jeff Watts. So uh, I knew with Kurt, I, it, was, it started with Kurt, and I knew that Emmanuel Wilkins would be a perfect. Uh, compliment to him, like a Lee Morgan playing with Benny Golson or Charlie Parker and Dizzy. I just knew that they would fit well. I didn't know realize that they were both from Philadelphia, so that that was the added bonus. And uh, I knew I wanted to try a different bass player, and I thought Bob Robert Hurst could come in and and just uh, give lead us into a the next level. And it's exactly what he did. And I wanted someone young on piano that what could just like kind of bring a fresh outlook to things and that's why I got Julius and it worked out it worked out perfectly I, one of the things I learned with Benny Golson was um, how to put things together I might not be able to write songs very well or have like a 
conceptually strong that way, like a Kurt Rosenwinkel or a manual. But I had I, I do know how to kind of put people together. So that was kind of nice to do. And uh and I just when I was I need I needed to um we did a rehearsal, man, and these guys were like bringing their tunes. It was so great. And I I went running after rehearsal. I'm like, wow, I, I, I kind of felt a little um like I wasn't doing enough. Like hmm. I needed to write something, which I I can't write on their level. And so I I was running. And things come to me when I I, I jog each day, and I was trying to come up with a, a song based around like Harold Mayburn's comping, and I was trying to come up with a melody, and it was coming to me, and basically it brought me to um, this song Harold wrote called "In Which Direction You Headed In." When the last time we played with Harold before he died was at the Vanguard. Mm -hmm. And this this uh, writer Russ Musto asked Harold to play that song, which I'd never played with Harold. We I played with Harold for like thirty five years, and we never played that song. That song was on Lee Morgan's Lee Morgan's last sessions record, and Harold started playing it, and uh, it was great. And so I was when I was running, that that song came to me. And I called up his son Michael Mayburn, and I asked him if it'd be okay. And Michael said he'd been thinking the last week about that song and listening to it, and it was kind of hoping that someone would uh, redo it. So it was all, it, it was made very clear to me that, that that was like the anchor of the record, like which direction it headed. And it all made sense coming out of COVID. Right. Uh, you know, and the things, the, the style I used to play, I mean, the style I play, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s and, and trying to play with guys like Clifford Jordan or Johnny Griffin or Benny Golson, Cedar Walden, McCoy Tyner, George Coleman, Curtis Fuller, they're not here anymore. And uh, it's COVID hit and, uh, and coming out of it, it's like, um, it seemed like the new wave was kind of really taking place, a new like the new wave of music. And um I need to change, like most people. You got to kind of adapt to the times. You could stay that same old person, but right, right. those guys aren't here anymore. You know, that's just it's a sad truth. And uh, and these young guys are taking over, and and there's like a new kind of music happening. And um, I kind of wanted to kind of flow with that. You know, play with uh, back to the vanguard with Kurt, and then uh, I did a week with uh, Brad Meldow. These are two guys that like. They just, they're playing free. They're not playing something from the, I mean, they have, obviously they have their roots in the past, but they're playing now. Okay. And uh, I wasn't necessarily playing that, man. I was, uh, I spent many years trying to play the perfect Max Roach solo. And guess what? I never did. And I'm wondering why I was kind of frustrated a little bit. I mean, I had fun, but I was trying to speak through Max Roach and it wasn't working. Right. And so seeing Kurt and seeing Brad doing their thing and, and, and just, playing free with this, like over these incredible time signatures and chords and playing their own music. They, this, it just seems so free and that's the way I want to be. So sorry for the long answer, but that's basically it. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, j just an aside, cause you mentioned it because so you're, are you an, I'm a runner as well. Are, are you yeah. a, like an avid runner, like marathon? Every type? day. Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. It's amazing how how it clears the mind. I I get a lot of my musical ideas. Definitely, man. I, 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 if I if I well, I I go to church. If I go to church each day and go running, I'm I'm pretty much set for the day. Like nothing's really gonna take me down. Like, but running is most important, man. Like it's just like if like whatever problem you have in your mind or stress or worry, it seems like when you run, when you come back, it's kind of gone. It's amazing. I know it's uh, and people who don't run don't quite understand it, but yeah, yeah. well, I, I ran so much that I really messed up my knees. But uh, and the doctor was like, You gotta uh, you can't run anymore, you gotta ride the bike. I'm like, I'm not riding the bike, you gotta have the feet on the ground, man. I'm, I'm, I'm all and I was able to come back. I, I just I, I took like a month off and uh, did some stretching, but yeah, running is most important, have to do it each day. Wow, yeah, cool. Yeah, I get that. Um, so going back to the record, a couple of tracks that, uh, I mean, I, I love them all, but Filters, that is, that song is a monster, man. Yeah. Uh, how did, uh, 
How did that come to be? Is that a Kurt? Is that Kurt's song? Yes, uh, that was one of the songs we played. The first time I played with him with the Vanguard, and uh, when you listen to it, you know I, I was listening to it while I was running, and I'm like, oh, this seems okay. And then I get down to the nitty gritty of the hits, and like, I'm usually you know playing with Cedar and those guys and Pharaoh Sanders. You usually just hear things, and um, it's it's through just hearing it and playing. But this one's like, I don't think I can memorize this one, man. So uh, that one I had to take a, it, that took, that was like, that was the one song I wanted to play correctly because I didn't want to be reading it and, and get uh, like uh, all stressed out. I don't want to be looking at it while like, you know, I'm on the bandstand. And so that was, that was the one I really wanted to get right. And it's funny, once, once you get through some of those hits, you start thinking to yourself, damn, I'm doing it good. And the minute you say that, that's when you flub the hits, man. And like, I think that first week I did it right, uh, maybe twice out of six times. And then we're doing it again this week. And last night again, I'm like, obviously I know it now, but last night I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm doing, I feel so good on this now, man. The minute I said that, I missed the hit coming back in. <laughs> yeah. But it's such a great tune, man. Great, great tune. It is, and the solos are, are are great, and I love how like you have that sort of like Rosenwinkel and Wilkins kind of solo, you know, as a duo. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's cool. But yeah, that's one of those ones. I mean, that as a musician, like even it, when I first heard it, I knew it was complex, but mm -hmm. I just listened to it as a tune, and I said this is just a cool, great tune. But that's mm -hmm. one of those ones where you go back and you go, how do I got to try to figure this one out? And I'm trying to count it and figure it out. So that yeah. that's. The and then um bobby no bags did you write that one uh yeah that's the one i came up with <laughs> okay. I was, it, was, it was the day of the recording I, I got down there and i um the recording got delayed two hours because robert was something i don't know what happened anyway so i went running the central park and i was like oh it was like a gift from god like so it, it I, I got in the session feeling much better and that came to me. I was thinking, well, we got all this, you know, complex stuff. And like, I, I'm like, I wanted to feature Robert. And so, and I was thinking about those records like PC and uh, Philly Joe Jones. Um, so that's, that's, that's what all came to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, as a bass player, like that's the one it grabbed, grabbed me. I think Hearst is. Yeah. And plus he, it, I, he it was out, he was on the road with Diana Crawl and, uh, they lost his bags. He was like, he was posting like day five, no bags. And then he turned his name into Bobby, no bags. So like, uh, that was just funny, man. So that's, that was the title. Awesome. Cool. And then, so the other one I wanted to ask, um, so in what direction are you headed? That, I thought Kurt wrote that song. Was, did he write that piece? Or that's that Harold Mayburn. Mayburn. Okay. And here's how that came about. He, 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 he loved Elvin Jones, of course, and he and they used to play opposite to each other at the Birdland. And Harold we would play with singer like Johnny Hartman or Carmen McRae, and then it'd be the John Coltrane Quartet. And they'd hang out, you know, downstairs, like, and sit on, like, Budweiser boxes and uh, talk. And he said Elvin, a lot of times, answered your question with a question. And so Harold asked him if he wanted to ride home, and Elvin said, in what direction are you headed in? And so that's how Harold wrote that. And Harold, as you know, like that, some of that is in seven four. I'm like, Harold Mayburn, you're such a, you know, four four three four guy. And he said he didn't. He, he was just the melody comes to him, and he, he, he what, what, how he writes his songs is when he's basically walking, and he'll start whistling, and something comes to him. And he, he never planned it to be in seven four, and he didn't realize it until he he whistled. Uh, he wrote it out for Lee Morgan, it's, and it was just seven four. That's great. So that's why I knew that uh, that was going to be like the like the anchor of the record, like because Harold Mayburn passed and he meant so much to me, and so there was something from the past that really uh, made uh, built my foundation, so that I could jump into the future. I mean, it's it just now you see it. At the time, I didn't see it, but now I see it. That's how it works. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's it seems to me um, as a rhythm section player like yourself. The songs that are in odd time signatures, if you will, are most natural when you when you write them and don't even realize that they're yeah. like 
you try to force an odd time signature song. It always, sometimes you can almost feel that forcefulness. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of it. Well, that's why when you're playing with Kurt or Brad, they, they write it and they put it in a time signature and they're, and you're sweating and they're just flowing easy over like, wow, that's amazing, man. But they wrote it. Cool. Very cool. All right. So let's, um, let's jump back a little, if I could just tell me, tell me about your upbringing. I grew up in uh, South Hadley, Massachusetts. My father and mother, they're still alive. God bless them, they're 87. My father's a music teacher and I have four older brothers. And basically we lived in the second floor. My parents had the first room and then in back of it was my brother David's room. He's the oldest, he's a drummer. Okay. In the middle room was my brother James. Um, and then the other room was my brother John. And my brother Paul, he moves around the rooms. But I, I, I slept with my brother David's room there's, and um, he would get up and he had a beautiful set of drums and um, he'd go to school and he'd say, don't touch my drums, man. And I could see him walking down to school. And when I, when I, he got out of the view, I would jump on the drums. And there was something about playing the ride cymbal that made me really happy, even as like four or five years old. And there was something about, I remember seeing my brother James taking lessons with my father and he was just learning the saxophone and he was squeaking and my father was pointing at him like, um, it was getting a little hairy down there. And my <laughs> brother started crying because it was frustrating. And I, I just kind of walked back up the stairs and I'm like, I could hit these drums with no squeaks. And I don't think I need to take lessons from my father. So this seems like the easiest way out. And my brother was listening to, he loved Soul Train, Temptations, OJs, Earth, Wind, Fire. And then he also loved big bands. So uh, Buddy Rich, Maynard Ferguson, and Count Basie. We're a huge uh, Sonny Payne fans. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so I was listening to, I was playing along in his room with Buddy Rich, like West Side Story, and Count Basie, April in Paris. My brother James's room was, uh, he was a uh, transcribing freak. Huh. And he would transcribe Sonny Stitt, Dizzy Gillespie, Sonny Rollins. And that was in that room. And my brother John was um, like, J.J. Johnson, Coltrane. So it was like, a, it was kind of, a, it was funny, it was kind of like a 52nd Street where there's all those clubs. I had just these little, I'd go into different rooms and hang out and listen to what they were listening to. So basically that's my upbringing. And then I, there was, we have thousands and thousands of records. And I was listening to Big Band and uh, Max Roach and in eighth grade, my parents moved to Indonesia and I had to go with them. My brothers were in college and my brother John and James were like, oh, you got to go to Japan because there's all these records you can get there that you can't get here. And so we went on a record. I went on a record mission with my father and I bought uh, John Coltrane live in Tokyo and then Weather Report live in Tokyo, which is one of their first records. I was listening to Weather Report, like the 830 record. And yeah. it was like, that's like, I wouldn't say poppy, but this record uh, was like early 70s it was an Eric Gravat. And uh, it was total hardcore, like fusion hard, like rock. It was, right. it, was, it was like really electronic, not like 830. And I kind of liked it. And, uh, so I went back through Japan. I bought Miles Davis live in Tokyo, thinking that it would be like Weather Report live in Tokyo because it was live in Tokyo. Yeah. And uh, that's when I first heard Tony Williams. And uh, that, well, I changed everything. And through just a little uh, uh, research, I found out that he'd studied with Alan Dawson. So I immediately started studying with Alan Dawson for the next two years. Okay. So that's really, uh, yeah, my brother, John, man, and he, he, he did everything for us, man. He brought us up to jazz in July where that's up in UMass where you can see Max Roach or Billy Taylor, uh, Ted Dunbar, and then uh, down to Springfield at uh, Theodore's where they have jam sessions on Saturdays. And then one of the main ones was in Hartford at the 880 club. And there was uh, a trio there, Nat Reeves, um, Don De Palma on piano. Mike Duquette on drums, and they they brought in guys from New York like George Coleman or uh, 
Clifford Jordan, Slide Hampton, Frank Strozier, George Coleman. So we were able to see these, like, like they look like, what, like, uh, not superheroes. Yeah, like superheroes. They're just like, just giants. Right. And that was really, it was really because the, my house had a ton of records, and uh, my father was a music teacher, and my brother John and James really. Uh, took music seriously and John took us everywhere. So I really owe a lot to them. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. John lives, uh, I don't know, I think the next town over from, well, he teaches the next town over from. Oh, Mark. great. Yeah. Um, great. So in terms of early influences, is it, it was it Tony Williams and, and Max and, and those guys or? Um, well, definitely um, early on, Buddy Rich, Sonny Payne, and then Max Roach, and then UMass. Max Roach was coming to UMass um, maybe once a month. So we would go up there and see some of his drum master classes. So, and I uh, I had to audition for my brother's band. I had to learn Sandu and uh, Slow Boat to China. Mm -hmm. And he had a band called Good Vibes, John did. And uh, so it was definitely Max and then Tony. And then uh, basically Art Blakey. And then when I got to New York, uh, my second teacher was the great Art Taylor, you know, Giant Steps, Red Garland Trio, uh, all those great records with Jackie McLean. So I started studying with him, and that was one of the greatest things I ever did in my life. Was uh, I looked him up, and he was there up in Sugar Hill in Harlem. So I started taking lessons with him. So and when I got to New York, obviously I saw everybody: Roy Haynes, Elvin Jones, Art Blakey, Jimmy Cobb. Um, but my two Main guys that I really loved in New York were Billy Higgins and Art Taylor. Oh, wow. Yeah, great. Yeah, Billy Higgins was probably the main one I saw a, a trillion times. Mm -hmm. The most stunning person, the, the most stunning two things I saw in music, one was uh, the first time I saw Roy Haynes. I was completely blown away. And uh, one of the other times was um, Art Taylor would play, and after his gigs, uh, a lot of times Walter Davis would come, and they'd play piano drums duo and they just play bud powell tunes and that that floored me that that was really unbelievable yeah. so i'd say those those guys were really the main ones and the guy i live up in river i live in riverdale new york mm -hmm. there's not much here besides trees oh they have one good deli and uh lewis hayes lives here so okay. that makes me feel good i never see him but i know he's only five minutes away how oh, crazy yes <laughs> yeah, um so did you you studied in Massachusetts first, or did uh, did you study at Patter, uh, William Patterson? Yeah, well, I mean, I was studying with Alan Dawson as a, a, in high school. Okay. And uh, and there was another person there that meant a lot to us, was this guy named Charles Greenlee. He was a trombone player from Detroit, playing Dizzy's band in the 50s. He moved to Springfield, and he was good buddies with uh, Archie Shep. So those wow. two were like, uh, you were able to go to them and kind of see what real music was about. Yeah. And when I, then I went to William Patterson in 86 to 90. And that's where I met Rufus Reed and Harold Mayburn. Harold Mayburn was a teacher there. And also there's a lot of great musicians there, Doug Weiss, Peter Bernstein, and Bill Stewart. And uh, I used to practice next to Bill Stewart and he was just practicing all day long. And, you know, we'd go out and get like a cheesesteak or play basketball. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh, man, Bill Stewart's back practicing, kicking ass. So he was a big inspiration. My brother John lived in New York, and my brother David lived in New York. And so I would go every weekend to, go, to stay with them. So that's why I was able to see a lot of people that I did. I was, I'm just, I was young enough then to still see some of the masters that were alive. You know? right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So was the first big, like, name or uh, junior cook for you? Uh, I yeah, that was my first record was Junior Cook on a misty night. Mm -hmm. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, you leave me breathless, and that was the that was the first guy that I really got to. That um, we started playing at Augie's every weekend, and that's now Smoke the club, but it used to be called Augie's. And um, through him, basically with him, I met Cecil Payne, and we started playing a lot together. Piano player Richard Wines, this bass yes. player John Orr that used to play with Thelonious Monk, yep. and 
my first kind of big gig was uh, outside of that traveling was John Hendricks. Mm -hmm. I only lasted like three weeks. I wasn't really ready for it. My first main gig was uh, Benny Golson at uh, Sweet Basil. Okay. And uh, I stayed with him for like eight years. But wow. through him, yeah, I got to play with Art Farmer, Curtis Fuller. That really, and people would come see you like George Coleman, Betty Carter, Ray Bryant, those guys. It was, that was a big deal. Uh, that was the first time, I, my first week at Sweet Basil. I got through the week, it was Sunday night. First set, played. Second set, I'm like, ah, it's over. I, I made it, man. I didn't die. <laughs> and uh, Roy Haynes comes in, sits right, and starts staring at me with these beautiful sunglasses and cowboys has. I'm like, ah, oh, man, what am I going to do now, man? <laughs> and Benny goes like, okay, we're going to open up with stable mates and piano gets the first solo. And Joe, me and you are going to play a duo and you have to play everything, you know, because Roy Haynes is here. I'm like, man, everything I know is <laughs> Roy Haynes. What am I going to do, man? But it worked out. It, that was nice. It was so Benny Golson was the first guy. Cool. What was he? What was he like as a as a band leader? Oh man, beautiful man. Uh, just articulate, very clean, uh, suit and tie. Had the big uh, pocket square. Uh, very intelligent, and it was just. I mean, I, I think you, you take it for granted, man. But like, you're sitting there playing with them, and it's blues marks like Whisper Not, Stablemates. I remember Clifford. Along came Betty, and it's like all these, like, this man wrote these things. He just like, you think they're like, it's like you're playing with Duke Ellington. And he, he just couldn't have been nicer, man. And he and he paid well, and um, and he didn't, the only thing he ever said to me was, um, we were playing uh, uh, Whisper Not. He says, Joe, I need you to play a two-beat feel. Like, I said, I, well, I think I am. He's like, no, it sounds like you're soloing. And he took the stick and said, titin, 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 titin. And that was, the, that was the one thing he told me. That he was, was great, man. He was great. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, obviously, there's a ton of names. I know you did a ton of records with uh, Eric Alexander. Yes. Uh, how'd you hook up with him? Um, my second year at William Patterson, he came. His first year, he went to Indiana. And he was like a, there's certain guys back then that just played great. Mm -hmm. And Bill Stewart, uh, Peter Bernstein, these guys, like, they were immediately like, they already seemed like they were professional. And uh, Eric came in and he was like that too. And he formed a tremendous bond with Harold Mayburn. And me and him would play duos all night long. And uh, we like play as just fast as possible for an hour, and then do something else. And that's like we, he practiced a lot, and then we, and then we'd spend like three hours doing duos, and then we eventually had apartments together and living together, and we're uh, wow, we were brothers, man. It's not we are, uh, it wasn't like uh, so. I moved to New York, and he moved to New York, and it, it was been a kind of inseparable sense. And he had a, a really good group with Harold and myself and either Nat Reeves or John Weber on bass. And we, we had a lot of work. That was, that was really a great time. We traveled a lot around the world. Great. Cool. Yeah. And then just one other name I wanted to ask you about, um, Pharaoh Sanders. Can you talk? Oh about yeah. Him? Well, it was, um, I was playing with Diana crawl and we kind of got fired. We kind of left at the same time. And, uh, it was kind of stupid. We were young. We should have stuck it out longer because it was a great gig. But, you know, you're young. You're like, oh, I want to get out there and, you know, really hit. And uh, it was kind of a mistake. So we were let go. And I got back to New York. And uh, I, I was talking to George Coleman, who I've been playing with, and uh, to Harold Mayburn. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, Farrell's in town. And... Um, he, he needed a drummer, but he got one, but I'll tell him about you. And so they, he fired the drummer the night before and got me because of George. Oh. And I'm like, Farrell Sanders, there's a guy well, I knew, but I never really listened to his records. Sure. And it was, it, was, uh, it was stunning. And George was like, all you have to do is just play hard, man. Just swing hard. And that's what I tried to do and, and not let him like out, like 
out energy you mean like like or like i didn't want him to turn george said don't have him turn around like he needs more from you just make sure you're pumping out um energy and that's what i did and uh man i stayed with him for like 16 years and he was unbelievable man was spiritual his tunes you could play like these songs and like we'd go we'd fly over to sweden and play a festival and might play the tune ole for the whole festival the whole hour right and then play maybe create as a master plan but he'd be playing and, and just get into a thing and and the people out there going crazy is almost like a grateful dead concert yeah he had that kind of uh that kind of following i guess you know he did and, and like uh man for the last three years i was trying to get him managers and get, but i don't know why people didn't uh what what it was like something a lot of people don't see the beauty in these these musicians were like a Harold Mayburn or Farrell. Like when you when you're with Farrell, the people go crazy. But like, I don't know, management or I don't know, like how they don't see it. But no one really picked up on it. And uh, man, but he was uh, stunning. And he, he was uh, he was very loyal. And we had the same group, me, Nat Reeves and William Henderson. And he, he couldn't have been nicer, man. And don't, I, the only thing, I, in 16 years, we never had a rehearsal. I never had any music. And maybe the only thing he said to me was like, just whatever you do, play it strong. And that was it. <laughs> it's amazing, right? You know? Yeah, but, it's, but it does seem to be a pattern, I think, you know, with, with some of these greats, especially coming out of that era, you know, Pharaoh knowing Coltrane and such. Yeah. Uh, even Miles didn't seem like a guy who gave, you know, when I talked to uh, like Ron Carter and such, mm -hmm. they didn't seem to give much specific direction, you know? They really just yeah. let the musicians do. We, I hired you to, to be a per, be you, you know? And, and to fit. Yeah, I guess the only, the only uh, <clears throat> I guess if you weren't there for the next gig, then that's your, <laughs> that's your, uh... <laughs> that's it. Whatever, but yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't a beat down for sure, or do this or that, blah blah blah, and and or make you stressed out and like, or you got to do this. It's like they they let you, they hire you for you, and let you do and let you be you. And that that's I love that man. Like, uh, you know, when when people used to sometimes get herald, they put all this music in front of them, and I could never understand it. Like, I I just want Harold to be as free and let him be the best herald he could be, and just let him play, man. And uh, I love that. Uh, Kurt and Brad are like that, man. It's just that you just have to learn their music. But they're like that, but their music is a little more uh, involved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, their music's not easy. Uh, yeah. All right, so um, any projects you're currently working on? Uh, just something about the Vanguard this week with Kurt, and that's been a great, great fun. Uh, he's got like, we uh, had to learn like 16 of his originals. So it's been, I've been listening to his music every day for like a, two months. And so it's, it's great to actually go in and finally play it. So that's really about it. And then I'm, um, no real record things. Just um, just play, the whole focus is just playing with Kurt this week at the Vanguard. Oh, yeah, cool. That's yeah. to be focused on, I'd say. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, anything else? Did I miss anything? Anything else you want to say? Uh no, I always I always love messages to my old roommate Jimmy Lovelace, the drummer. I used to play with Wes Montgomery. He was a great drummer. If people uh used to check him out, he was one of the smoothest drummers of all time. And uh, that's really about it, man. Cecil Payne, Harold, uh, all these great guys that uh, that were around us and, and I got to play with uh, meant the world to me. Yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, talking with you man it's great oh, yeah, absolutely i'm sure i'm sure we'll hook up some point in person Beautiful, man. um great man and I, I appreciate it and uh really truthfully uh, the record's great and i want appreciate I, that man. hope my listeners check it out because uh you know i i, I one thing i want to say about it is i i like the fact that you use more contemporaries if you will on this mm -hmm. one and, and i and i i see there seems to be well a lot of these guys are no longer around some of the greats but there seems to be, it has a group concept that I think is, is really cool, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, like there's, there's people that are stuck in the way things used to be and uh, I get it, but it's right. not, it's just, it's just, they're just, it's not, it's not there anymore. 
Right. And uh, and there's there's a whole a new wave of young people that want to that are hearing new things like like well, Kurt Rosewick, all these guitar players that come from Kurt, they're not they're not playing like Wes Montgomery. And but these and, and what's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. But they're it's like Kurt created this new music, and uh, there's a ton of people that love it. So you either got to get in it or you got to uh, get away from it. But so what are you gonna do? You can't get away from it because it's so good. If once so you get in there, and um, yeah, it's it's not like training to to play with Hank Jones. Right. It's, it's a different thing. But you you got to uh, that's what's happening now, and it's great, man. It's great. You know? Yeah, and I, and I guess it's, you know, I still even, which is weird, but I think of Kurt as a young player, but he's been on the scene for, for a while. And, yeah, he sure has, has. and there are young guys who are influenced by him, you know, so it's, uh, it's you know, it's just a progression of this music, I guess, and which is great. Uh, definitely. But, well, if, if, if your listeners want to uh, follow me, that'd be nice on Instagram. Uh, Joe Farns with drums. That, that's always a big help. Absolutely, man. As uh, you know now, man, like, that's part. That's part of the being musicians and having a social media. Yes, it's all. It's a different world, man. It's it's all about self marketing now. And yeah, I mean, there's people out there like, well, Sonny Stitt wouldn't do it. Like, <laughs> we're not Sonny Stitt, and it's not 1950 anymore. Yeah, and know? if he lived now, he probably would. He probably would do it. You know, but or have someone do it for him. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, right, if Brian talk- Carter's on social media, we can be on social media. Man. Oh, Brian Carter has made himself so accessible. Yeah. That- I mean, uh, I, I was lucky enough to, to speak with him and, you know, he was, he was so pleasant and gave me, yeah. so he played, he, he grabbed his bass and played it on, on, a, you know, for me on Zoom. I was like, that's great. It's Ron Carr. It's a guy, awesome. you know, wanting to play like, so it's cool, man. All Beautiful. right. All Thanks, right. Jay. Take care, man. All right. See you later, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you.